So, onward. Time versus history. Right. So, a couple big things going on. And some of my sources today were, again, my favorite, Marjorie Garber, the 1599 book from James Shapiro, because this is, here we are, kind of the height of his career. 1599 is Henry V, it's Julius Caesar, it's As You Like It, and it's Hamlet. Oh. 1599 to 1600, I mean, this is quite the period, is it not? And um, so what James Shapiro has done is he has looked at this particular year and really tried to link events that happened in um, the Elizabethan world and in London to actual specific things in the play. And it's probably the first time that I had a real sense of the fact that he was really responding to things that were happening daily in London when I read the chapter on spe specifically on Julius Caesar. I, too, bought the notion of him as genius separated above the clouds came out of and was his own separate thing and that it was all quote unquote universal. That it actually did not have anything to do with whatever was going on and that's why we do them 400 years later. When point in fact is what you really can discover, especially if you look at this particular chapter about Julius Caesar in this book, is linking to like the events that actually happened and how they showed up in the play. It's that direct. Lorraine Hansberry used to talk a lot about how things became universal. You have to start out with very specific things, and then they become universal from there. So in some ways, uh, I think that this is kind of flipping on its uh, side a little bit, the way we sort of, some, some of us, I'll just say that that was the way I was taught it, right? That that was sort of the notion of Shakespeare as a sort of romantic genius, kind of by himself, you know, um, untouchable. Um, the point of fact is I think he had his, uh, his feet very much on the ground. He was a Taurus. He had to have his feet on the ground. So uh, part of, so there's some, some big things that are going on around 1599. We're going to talk kind of really specifically about kind of what's going on in the world. Probably even more specifically than we talked about measure for measure when we kind of gave sort of a general overview of sort of what was going on in Elizabethan jeopardy in life. This is definitely an Elizabethan play, obviously, because it's 1599. So she dies in 1603. So think about that, right? So we're getting toward the end of of this era. So, major preoccupation for Elizabethans was civil war. Now, also, end of the 1590s, we're just about to Henry V, last history play. For now. I mean, there's Henry VIII coming. But right, that period, uh, that decade really is the decade of history plays. And they're all about civil war, are they not, really? Somebody's attacking somebody. Somebody's always about, it's all about succession. And who's, who's right, who's not. And I'm gonna, I don't like the answer to that, so I'm gonna have a civil war, right? All these plays do this over and over and over again. So it seems to me that and when you have 10 plays, or however many, really eight or something, that really deal with this kind of preoccupation, is it kind of focuses a preoccupation for Elizabethan during this time. It's my own theory, too, that it's all about, they're all about anxiety about who's going to take over after Elizabeth dies. Okay. Um, so <coughs> you've got this sort of link, you know, into what happens in Julius Caesar, even though it's something that's historically set back in the cusp between, you know, um, em empire and the republic. Um, republic and empire, um, right? And in the spectacle of the Rizpin himself. So this notion of civil war not only just being literal, right? You've also got it embodied in a particular character as well, right? What's going on internally. Now this is also um, uh, uh, an heiress there are subtle notion about sort of the, the kinds of things you're fighting against. You're fighting against God, you're fighting against society, you're fighting against individuals, and you're fighting against yourself. And that this constitutes sort of like, you know, that sort of scrambling up of yourself is kind of how you get to have a really a dimensional character. And in some ways, that's exactly sort of the struggle that the tragic hero goes through, is, is really struggling with all those kinds of things. And this notion of civil war and the political assassination and fight for succession, right? Any of this happening. And what we're going to hear about uh, in a little bit uh, today is how many times in the 15th 90s there still were attempts on Elizabeth's life. That there were political assassinations still going on. We talked the last couple times ago, right, about the Catholics and the Protestants and sort of the sort of, the, mm, while there may have been sort of an official truce of sorts and sort of the Protestant. Um, supremacy uh, that Elizabeth um, uh, sets up in 15, 
this of a, whatever the act of succession is, you know, if you can't look up something, I'm not going to hold on to it. You know, not, not, this is the new rule. If you can look it up on Google, you don't have to hold on to it in the back of your head. So, uh, whatever that rule is, whatever that law was that said Protestant was it, there still is the sort of skirmishes that, that continue to happen in St. True in the 1590s as well. Um, and we'll talk about that in a second. So civil war is a big thing that's kind of on everybody's mind, or seems to be. The next big thing that seems to be on everybody's mind is sort of the nature of kingship, which of course is linked to this notion of sort of like who's going to see political assassination, what happens, the consequences, we don't have, blah, blah, blah. And here we've got uh, the, a character, Julius Caesar, both loved and feared, right? You begin to see, even though this thing is set wherever the heck it's set, and based on whatever he knows about wherever the heck it's set, right? I mean, we know so much more about the era of King John than Shakespeare knew about. In that, by, you know, in that History Channel kind of way, you know what I mean? I mean, we know a lot more. Than, so you have to take it sort of like where he's at. And of course, he's not interested in writing the History Channel version. He's interested in taking these events and figuring out an entry point that's really got uh, a lot of juice to it. We'll talk about that a lot um, in two sessions when we, we chart the play about where he starts the play and how hot and how hard that really is. Um, but it's also really interesting to sort of keep, bear in mind, it's, it's about fiction. It's about taking that and trying to make the, take the greatest advantage of it that you can. And then also Caesar is, is without an heir in the play, right? So you can begin to see actually in Elizabethan England, the notion of ancient Rome is not that, it's not far removed from that. This is part of the collapse that's happening, right? It's all about sort of the rise of sort of Renaissance in a way, which means sort of going back to classic Greek and Roman models, right? The whole notion of classical theater is all to, to replicate that, to say, if I can link myself back to Greece and Rome, we must be the better culture, the better civilization. This is all happening here as well. So the fact of the matter is that there's a lot of things in Julius Caesar that you might as well just say was Elizabeth. You might as well just have said it's about Elizabeth. Or you could look at it that way, right? Just some facts about it. So it's an interesting thing that wasn't, it wouldn't be a foreign entry to say, well, I'm going to write about something in the past. It would have felt very, probably very relevant and knowable how to enter that play using this information. Okay. Another big notion, which again comes from Elizabeth, is uh, public versus private, right? <coughs> especially as she's aging, especially in the 1590s. Every couple of years there was a portrait done of her, like an official portrait done, and then from that portrait everybody then could sort of make their little copies for the, you know, little kiosks that they could sell things, you know, on Times Square, right? <laughs> so, uh, one year, it was like 1593 or something, the guy that did the portrait made the uh, mistake of actually um, painting her as she was at age 63 or whatever it was, and um, she didn't like that. <laughs> so the, that, was, that, that was not to be copied, right? And so we've all heard a lot of those stories about, you know, the, the makeup that goes on and the lead that's in the makeup and probably contributed to pock fit. You know, I mean, sort of this really interesting uh, continued public, um, I'm perfect, beautiful, young, virginal Elizabeth that she's going to portray for the rest of her, for her whole life, versus sort of the private Elizabeth, who has her own demons, one would assume, because she's human, right? Um, and and um, so it just, again, this notion of Julius Caesar as practically being Elizabeth's uh, a substitute in a way, right? Because in the play, we've got this huge public persona, and he's described, certainly has physical ailments that are, that are, that are seen as weaker, than the way he's portraying himself in public. So this kind of notion of, everybody knows this game, public private. Everybody knows this game, right? It's all theater, isn't it? It's a very useful metaphor for Elizabeth. It's all theater. Okay. Um, again, about sort of the notion of theater in terms of civic uh, pageantry, what's also, you know, the arrival of Caesar into the play, right? This was a constant, seemed to be a constant <coughs> thing in Elizabeth, always staging these entries into, into towns and putting on robes that were Roman-esque looking, right? And going through triumphal arches and things like that that was all very reminiscent. Again, trying to link yourself back to the glory that was Rome. If you could do that, you were then, uh, you, you just by association were glorious. You know what I mean? So we did all, he, she did all this kind of stuff. 
constantly about marking victories and, and milestones and stuff like that. And I think that that's also an interesting link um, with Julius, the, the play itself, and Julius Caesar, the character.